バーバーバーバーバーバーバーン !Top 5 weaknesses of navies, why they were and how to fix. So, I'm gonna say this now. Asking me to pick my top 5 is like asking me to pick which of my cousins I would pull from a burning house first. It's not nice, and I am honestly just going to ignore the whole number five. It's going to be my top weaknesses of navies. Some of them are going to be aggregate weaknesses, and why they were and how to fix. Now, some of them, honestly, you can't fix in the time allowed. What were their weaknesses in 1939 leaves me with a lot of scope to talk about what they could have fixed if they'd actually thought about it earlier. You know, if they'd had a revelation like, <gasps> infrastructure, that matters. <laughs> oh, happy days. Or, I don't know, hang on, perhaps, perhaps going for the biggest, most beautiful, massive thing is not necessarily the smartest idea. Or, and here's a startling revolution, a revelation, perhaps those funny looking people Um, please note I'm going to be saying this in character before anyone, play, play, you know, qu uh, sort of complains below. You know, who have slightly yellow skin and squinty eyes. Uh, perhaps they actually know something about aircraft carriers. And if I stop thinking about them in racial stereotypes, I could learn something and produce a decent ship. And a design which I can actually build and have available. However, that is... Mostly, I have to say, going to be coming up in part two, which is on the major Axis navies. Oh, that's going to be fun. Today is the major Allied navies, and. Well. This is going to require a fresh bottle of iron brew, I can tell, before I've even got into it. It is. So what are the ground rules? Well, there are, believe it or not, some ground rules. Wayne Boring's suggestion was this. Do an evaluation of each combatant Navy World or two and give us your list of their top five weaknesses in order, why those weaknesses existed, and how those weaknesses could have been addressed, if at all, on the date of January 1st, 1939, January 1st, 1940, January 1st, 1941, and January 1st, 1942. Makes sense. It's going to be done in six in about 12 parts. Each of those dates is going to be divided into three. Major Allied navies, major Axis navies, minor navies worthy of mention. Now, Wayne goes on. Yes, I know this would end up being a monthly series. Let's start in January 1st, 1901. Honestly, I'm not sure my blood pressure or the world's iron brew supply could last that long if I was doing this that long. It would have to become a joint project between me, Drakenfell, and we'd have to exclude Jamie out of the, the fact that he does actually live with small children who we presume his wife would, presume, uh, would prefer not to learn the amount of colourful language which could be produced at that point. My criteria for this, my entire criteria for this, has been no foreknowledge. Because if I start acting with foreknowledge, then I will rewrite the entirety of history. But, there are suggestions they had at the time, things they had at the time, which make sense, which they could have done. And if they had done, would have been sensible. And they knew this. There are probably going to be a few points I'm going to suggest things like they could have taken their torpedoes and done some actually actual legitimate diligent testing on them. It's an option. It's always an option. But without much further ado, let's go into the first option. What could the French really do in 1939? Well, 
to sum it up, Frigating Fudgical All. Please note what I said, YouTube. Frigating Fudgical All is all they could do. They have many, many issues. For starters, they could have continued building the Dunkirks, but they decided to build the Riculus. It's always nice to build a Riculu. It's always nice to build a Riculu. Uh, they've got the burn in service. They've got pretty much what they've got in service represents the maximum their infrastructure could actually have allowed them to build. Now, there is an option, though, out there, which is not a stupid option. And really not a stupid option. This idea is, instead of you going along go with the uh, with the uh, sort of Dunkirks and going, they're nice ships, but, you know, they've only got 13-inch guns, eight of them, could go, well, we're developing a 15-inch gun. We could keep building the same design, because it's a fairly decent design, maybe upgraded a bit. And um, we could fit, I don't know, two treble 15-inch guns in them. We could keep building ships that we already know how to build, that we can build, that we have the space to build. And we could just, just put in a 15-inch gun but we could put six of them in, in two triple turrets forward. And then we could upgrade the older Dunkirk and Strasbourg, but we could keep the line going. This would fit with our infrastructure and wouldn't overtax our industry. And so we might actually get more vessels into service more quickly. It's an option. It's certainly an option. Uh... The earlier you go back, the more you can change. But realistically... What does France really need to do? Well, they need torpedo boats. That would have made, been helpful for them, in, certainly in def and submarines, in terms of defending their Far Eastern Empire later in the war, but that's with foreknowledge. But even with knowledge at the time, those are areas which they could have maximised. It's one of the strange things. When you're dealing with a navy which is constantly wrestling with the Juna Col and the idea of it, the fact that they have relatively so few torpedo boats and smaller ships available in World War II and the beginning of World War II is a bit strange. Submarines, you can go, well, they have 81. Yes, they do, but most of them, I would argue, were not really that modern. And they could have been better. They had Dover Yards. But on uh, realistically, the French aren't knocked out of World War II because of their navy, in terms of foreknowledge. Their navy is one of their most powerful elements. But what are they are prepared for to do is not really that great. Honestly, the navy has been stripped of funds just as surely as the army has been. The army hasn't got radios, the navy hasn't got infrastructure, and hasn't built anything. So, none of it's good. There is no good news here. There is nothing for the French to do in January 1939 that can really fix their situation. I wish there was. For their sake, I wish there was. But there isn't. It's painful. It's painful for many reasons. Not just because the French Navy is a proud and capable force, but because the French Navy, for all its ills, and for all I'm not the biggest fan, could have been so much more capable. They have the industry, they have the infrastructure. They have the knowledge and understanding that can produce very good ships. They have the burn. Why? 
this is going to sound terrible, but why? You know, the French weren't even forced to convert to burn. There wasn't the scenario like the British and the Americans where basically getting a conversion was a good thing. The French didn't have that level of coercion being placed on them. They could have avoided the burn. They could have built something pretty. And that's the other thing. You can sit there with their infrastructure and their systems going. What are the limitations for the French? The limitations for the French are their yard size, their armor production, their gun production, all those things. One of the areas that are actually quite good is producing aircraft. They're producing a fairly large number of them. So actually producing an aircraft carrier would have been a very sensible asset. They could have produced it with minimal impact on their existing infrastructure. But that didn't happen. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen because, honestly... <sighs> the French Navy doesn't really know what it's for. Yes, you'll respond. They were for fighting the Regia Marina, were they? Were they really just about fighting the Italian Navy? Because if they are, then frankly building these ships doesn't make much sense. They have range, they have all sorts of things they don't need for fighting the Ranger Marina. They're on their doorstep. They literally share a land border. You do not have to go that far in naval terms to find the Ranger Marina to beat up. They are next door. It's kind of like when people start going, ah, oh, yes, the Royal Navy was building just to fight the Germans in the, in the early 1930s. A, the German Navy doesn't really exist, and B, the Royal Navy, the Navy, the Royal Navy would need to fight in the North Sea versus the Navy they would need to fight anywhere else in the world is going to be different. And you can tell they're presuming future wars aren't going to be in the North Sea as far back as 1916, because what are they building? Battle cruisers rather than battleships. Because you need a stonking great big battle fleet to fight in the North Sea because you're at such close range of your proximity enemy there is no point in having a battle cruiser to juke it out. All they can do is reconnaissance. They can't really do much else. But if you're fighting globally against another enemy who has global communications and global trade lines, let's say is another island nation, which is a, it's a sort of a potential point at that point, despite an alliance and them just fighting alongside, but there are some issues going on in Japan, or perhaps other powers who could get conceivably annoying battle cruisers become very useful for the global stage. These ships, they are very useful for the Far East. As long as you perhaps don't presume your Far East opponent has mahusive 18-inch guns. Because the fact that these have a quadruple 13-inch gun system is almost embarrassing. I mean, I'm embarrassed by the King George V's and their 14-inch saga, and that's mainly because why? In a world of ships being built with 16-inch guns, how? I don't know. Un For the life of me, understand Lord Chatfield fixating on the 14-inch gun. I know in theory there is a lot of in theory going around there, but surely at some point he sat down and actually was thinking while well, drinking a scotch and mulling over his life and going why why the 14 inch gun and yes we will come back to and go politicians they wanted it for the very street true but british politicians are very easy to coerce from a naval perspective on certain things maybe not on ship numbers maybe not on sales of sh uh, ships but honestly in the 1930s, some of the papers are sufficiently right-wing to make Genghis Khan feel, uh, feel worried about them. They could have been quite easily turned into a rabble-rousing, we-want-a-bigger-gun battleship campaign. Remember, you're still talking about a country which, less than three decades ago, had had a we-want-eight and we-won't-wait campaign for battleships, which actually resulted in... The Royal Sovereigns. 
this is the thing. There was not only the campaign, the snatchy slow, uh, the, the snazzy slow, uh, slogan. There was also the actual victory. It's Boaty McBody face, but they won. <sighs> Never count out a snazzy slogan when it's uh, talking about the UK. So France, they have a lovely navy. In terms of the ships, they some of the ships they built are really good ships. But they get fixated on things like quadruple turrets. Which almost everyone seems to have an absolutely terrible time with. Because they sound so good. On paper. Until you start working out the complications of them. So here is... My point again, instead of having a quadruple 13-inch Dunkirk, have a treble 15-inch Dunkirk. Spend the time, get the 15-inch guns out. Maybe just buy them off the British. The British will have a 15-inch gun going around. They will, if they hope if if perhaps if the French pay for the development of the 15-inch 45. The British will go, why are we building the 14-inch gun? We already have the 15-inch paid for by the, for, by the French. Um, you know, build it under license. Build a nice treble turret. Have that in service. Go be happy. Again, there's a treble turret which works. Okay, it had an interesting start in life, but it works by now. It's sitting on top of Nelson and Rodney. Again, across the pond, your closest ally. An ally you are so close with that sometimes the Royal Australian Navy and Royal Canadian Navy feel like they are the for uh, they are the foreigners in the relationship. If you've been really nice, you might have even got a 16-inch gun design of the Brits. And yes, perhaps your infrastructure can build it, perhaps it can't. Worst comes to worst, then you buy the whole thing from the Brits. Either way, a Dunkirk design with 6.15 or 6.16 inch guns suddenly becomes a very scary, very powerful ship. And if you're building them en masse at the displacement they are, you're allowed quite a few on your treaty limitations. Because Dunkirks are light. At 26,500 tons, 26,100 long tons in standard, they are very, very nice when you're comparing them to your 175,000 ton limit. If you're prepared to be a little bit over, you could theoretically get seven of these. Seven Dunkirks. If they were modified Dunkirks, and in fact, honestly, a treble turret, a treble 16 inch turret, or a treble 15 inch turret would probably actually be less weight, maybe enough to get them down to roughly 25,000 tons in some regards than the quadruple, because the quadruple has some very interesting mechanisms and also, of course, is divided down the center by that sort of brilliant idea to try and make them into two twin turrets. Yay, because that's not going to add complication or make it even more difficult to use. No, 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 that's going to be sensible. And we're going to be able to really stick enough armor that if something actually penetrates in, it's going to have an impact. Oh, we can't, and it just makes things more complicated and heavier and more difficult. Oh, well, that was a sugar. Who would have seen that one coming? Who'd have thunk it? Um, but no, if they'd had gone with the sort of the 6 15 inch or 6 16 inch version, could have been lighter, they could have easily got seven. In the, in, in, under their production, they could have kept them going. And again, they're quite quick to build. They're able to keep, they, if they got the production line, built them. They could have kept building them. And in the facilities, they'd have been easier to assemble. And they could have had a, could have had a fairly large number of these capital ships ready to go in World War II. Which would have probably scared the Italians something. Yes, the Italians are cheating more, but... um. If you imagine seven of these, and let's say you have four operational in one point 
if you manage to have all seven. Those four could advance, line abreast at you, all firing all their guns, presenting both simultaneously the most difficult targets for you to engage, and forming, forcing you to have to turn broadside onto them to match their firepower. And again, if they've got 16-inch guns, then that's bigger than anything the Italians have. So, Royal Navy, the British. Well. Okay. All right. Probably coming across a little performative there, but it was necessary. The British, the Royal Navy. How many issues can we get into? Well, if we start off earlier, there is a lot of it. If we were talking about 1938, if we were talking about 1937, when the Japanese leave the treaty, there are lots of things you could do. If you could go back as far as 1936-35, you could probably change the King George V to a 15-inch 45 caliber gun. Just have nice free triple turrets. Thank you very much. And use that same 15-inch gun to upgrade every single other 15-inch ship in the Royal Navy. Yes, you could. There are so many things you could do. It. You could go back. There is plenty of infrastructure space. You could have been upgrading a Repulse, Hood, Barham, Malaya, all at the same time in, if you start off in 1938. In January 13, 1939, what could I do? I could probably pull Repulse in. I could re pull Repulse in. This is without foreknowledge, but I am just in the middle of up the, doing Renown. Renown is going to go through and going to be out soon. Honestly, I know what I'm doing. I could pull Repulse in, do, go, do exactly the same modifications I've just done to Renown, and get it done. Would I necessarily get it done by September 1939? No. Could I get it done by December 1939? Possibly, if I really put the pedal to the metal. What are the weaknesses for the Royal Navy in this period? Well, whilst it has a large number of ships on paper, a lot of them aren't modernised. There are two other vessels I could probably modernise quite quickly, because I don't need to do much work to them. Nelson and Rodney need their engines to retune. They are by this point nearly 20 years old. They need their engines done. Do it. They are the easiest ships in the Royal Navy to get at the engines of because literally the engines are under one section, the guns and all the other ammunition and heavy armor is over that section. You can get to the engines quickly. You can rip them out, you can put in new ones. Preferably more powerful ones so you can get a speed bump. Doesn't matter if you, it's 23 knot ships, fine. But if you can get them up to 27, 28 knots, you're golden. It's going to be difficult and interesting because they are only two sharp ships. But you can probably get them up to 28 knots with the new engines available that time. Why does this help? Because the Royal Navy is short of two things. Fast, modern capital ships. Fast and modern, being separate. Yeah. They are. They haven't built them. And Rodney and Nelson do not help because they are not fast. They are modern-ish, but they are not fast. We could go back and completely redesign the King George V design, but we won't get into that particular maelstrom of nuttiness. Other things they could do. In January 1939, order a second HMS Unicorn. She could be given a sister, and considering the very limited amount of armor, weaponry, and engine that goes into her, so she technically becomes an auxiliary, because she's technically supposed to be an auxiliary ship, hence not coming from the carrier tonnage, technically, there are all sorts of... This is why she's called an a forward aviation support ship, not an aircraft carrier, because she's technically a support ship, an auxiliary, not a carrier. She just happens to really look like one. If they can do that, they can get one built. 
and they can accelerate on the construction. One of the interesting things that often comes up is the amount of times I hear people go, oh, well, in 1939, the only carrier air arm which could face down the Japanese was the US Navy's. Eh, eh. Largest carrier arm in the world at this point in January 1939. In January 1939. The Royal Navy has seven aircraft carriers. They technically have a lot more aircraft. They're going through a transition. It's one of those interesting periods because the fleet air arm is being taken off well, taken away from its dual parentage to be given to the whole of the Royal Navy. In fact, if I had my way, that would have happened earlier. But again, I'd have to go back in time to get that to happen earlier. Earlier than 1939, definitely. Now, if I can get carriers accelerated, because they are old carriers, and I do know that. And I know I've not got enough aviation support in the Far East. I know I haven't got enough aviation support in the Mediterranean. The only way I can have aviation support in those areas is aircraft carriers. So therefore, I need to accelerate my aircraft carrier construction program. I've got several under construction. I can accelerate Unicorn. I can accelerate the illustrious class. Unicorn and a sister could be the easiest for me to accelerate because they require the least. I could get those built very quickly if I was prepared to open up the purse strings. Now, before people start going, oh, well, does Britain have the money to open up the purse strings? They do. Remember, from the 1920s onwards, they've been saving money by, you instead of spending money on defense, they've been spending money paying down the debt from World War I, which was a government decision. However, by 1937, they are starting to consider whether they should change this. The uh, My view is if they just slacken off a little bit more, of the repaying debt and focus a bit more on rearmament, you'd be amazed at how quickly and how much they could build. You really would. Now, the biggest weakness for the Royal Navy in this period, though, is beyond aircraft carriers, it's beyond capital ships, it's submarines and anti submarine warfare. Because for both of those, they need more ships. And they know they need more ships. The thing is, though, they've decided they've got till 1942. Well, at least that's what the government, when they, if you take go back to 1932, when the government took off the 10-year rule, unofficially, unofficially, five years. They know they have the designs on paper. They've been working on the designs long enough. You need to bring forward the crash program. You need to start building those ships in January 1939, not wait around till June. You need to have brought, start order them in, ordering them in January. Preferably, you've ordered them in 1938. You've got designs there. And you need to order them in more than the UK. You need to order them in Australia. You need to order them in India. You need to order them in Canada. You need to order them in South Africa. Why? You need to order them into those countries, and you need to make the yard of the infrastructure that's supporting them built in those countries. So it's part of the order, especially if you can start in 1938, but you can start this in January 1939 and get it done before war begins. You can get the infrastructure built up, because if you can get turbine production going in those four countries, if you can get shipyards producing these ships in those four countries, if you can get all that going... You can really ramp out these ships. And nothing is a bigger force enabler in World War II than having a large number of anti-submarine warfare vessels. The only thing bigger than that in terms of enabling is having a large number of submarines. If the Royal Navy been able to build more submarines and stick some of them in the, so they didn't have to withdraw so many from the Far East to cover the Mediterranean, and if they'd been able to build, you know, have more submarines in the Mediterranean, have more submarines in the North Sea, then there would have been a very big hamper on Kriegsmarine, Reja Marina, and Imperial Japanese Navy operations. So these are all things they know and can be done in January 1939. Yes, you will not get those ships by the time war begins, 
but you can get those ships soon enough after war beginning, i.e. December to January 1930, 1940, that you could give the Royal Navy a very big boost. But you need to make it across the Navy, across the Commonwealth, across the Empire. You need to have production going in India. You need to have production going in South Africa. You need to have production going in Canada. You need to have production going in Australia. Why? Because if you build the infrastructure in to build these smaller ships in those places, they can start to support building bigger ships. You have Her Majesty's Australian Yard, Cockatoo Island. You have all those facilities there. You need to actually support them and build them up. And if those nations are all building these smaller escorts more quickly, you will have less losses at the beginning of World War II. The other thing I'd like to see is a wider, fast battle, uh, fast oiler camp uh, production line and actually get that going out. Now, if you could do that, you would have an advantage again, because if you build enough fast oilers and got them producing, those are quick ships you can quickly convert into aircraft carriers, escort carriers. And there are designs going around, so you could actually pre-build these ships, rather like the Japanese do, to be converted into aircraft carriers. So you could build an oil tanker, which is designed with all its funnel, etc. going up, I don't know, which side would the funnel go up on? Oh, how about the starboard side? Oh, that would be interesting. Would be interesting if that happened, wouldn't it? It would be interesting. So all the funnels and uptakes could go up the starboard side. And then if you needed to, you just stick a structure on top, which has a hangar and a flight deck above that. And boom. Island. Yes, we're good to go. We have an aircraft carrier. Convert one of the fuel tanks into the facilities you need to support the carrier. And it can still carry fuel. And you've got a combined escort carrier tanker. That'd be useful. And you could get those being built in Australia, in South Africa, in India, in Canada. And you could get them going in January 1939. And yes, again, the British do have designs going around. This is something they have considered. But it's getting the funds. Finally. Finally. The two other things they need to do. One make a massive order for aircraft engines and i mean an absolutely colossal order that forces rolls royce and probably bristol as well to actually develop something approaching a factory style production setup for their engines rather than a enhanced cottage industry style setup there is a reason why you end up with packard and other people coming in and building merlins later in World War Two, because Rolls-Royce, goodness lord we love them, but they do have issues when it comes to really churning out. They can air grow themselves to a certain level, but beyond that they cannot grow, because they're not really set up to produce engines in that way, in a mindless automaton factory way. Preferably, again, if you could put some factory production of these engines in other places in around the Empire would be really useful. So if you could, let's say, say, build aircraft also in India, and maybe then the fleet Aram would go, right, and we'll draw our aircraft from India's production lines. So the RAF's ones can come from the UK production lines. And, oh, that's great. That would be very useful supporting the Mediterranean fleet. And it'd be very useful for supporting operations in the Far East if that could be happening. It would be make sense to do dispersed infrastructure. And again, January 1939, it's tight, but it's not too late to start this. Especially as you consider those places would not be going to be getting bombed at the beginning of the war. So anything you start off in January 1939 is still going to be there and going to be going and able to be scaled up as the time goes on. United States. Right then. 1939, they have oodles of destroyers. 15 battleships, 5 aircraft carriers, 18 heavy cruisers, 19 light cruisers. They're 5 aircraft carriers. Well, they don't include Langley. But 
let's see what they do do they include saratoga lexington ranger <coughs> yorktown and enterprise Ranger is a weird diversion in the middle, but they do have four very nice carriers. Four very nice carriers. What can the US Navy do in January 1939? Well, they, of course, with hindsight, we know, have two years till war, roughly. But let's pretend we don't have that hindsight. What would we do in January 1939 without that hindsight if we are based on them? Well... What do they do? In September 1939, they order Hornet. Imagine if in 1939, January 1939, they turned around and gone ordering Hornet. And... Wasp, maybe? And possibly Essex, all to your count design. Maybe, I don't know. They'd ordered a set of four. So they had Hornet, Wasp, Essex, and Bonhomme Richard built to the Yorktown design. If we consider it, Hornet herself is ready. She is commissioned in October 1941 after starting construction in September 1939. So if you'd shifted back construction to January 1939, she could well have been ready months earlier. Instead of commissioning in October 1941, if you've been building four, and you spread, maybe you spread the build out over January, over January uh, nineteen thirty nine. So maybe one in January, one in March, one in May, and then the last one, August. If you'd done that, you could have been talking about vessels being completed that much early in 1941. You could have had them spread out across 1941. You could have had another one. Yeah, the last one could have come into service in September 1941. You never know. And the fact that they started slightly earlier before this, uh, before Christmas kicks in and Christmas holidays would have allowed you to get a really uh, much further on before the Christmas holidays break up your building. U.S. Navy, what do they really need to do? Seaplane tenders. They need some fast ones that they can move out, and a lot of seaplanes, so they can have the reconnaissance. They need to actually work on their U.S. Marine Corps, because the U.S. Marines uh, have a very interesting idea at this point about how they're going to be used to defend certain positions. Well, if they're going to do that, they need to actually have some portable artillery, and they need to have CB battalions probably formed up and working well before war begins. Because, or something, there's some construction battalions, because they're going to need them. In an island war across the Pacific, there is no doubt in my mind, and there should be no doubt in anyone's mind, the idea that they were going to need construction battalions. That they were going to need people who would go and construct things in war zones. So why they're not getting them organized in January 1939, I do not know. But there are lots of options there. The US Navy has many capabilities. They have a good core fleet. They also have a problem in their heavy cruisers. I am slowly working through them. This video will come out on Sunday. On the Monday will come out the Major Axis navies. On the Tuesday, will come out the Portland class. Not New Orleans, the Portland class. I decided to spin them back round. So I did them in date order rather than rather than discursive order. So I don't. Uh, so you do get to hear about the Portlands first. 
The Portlands, famously, and you're going to hear a lot more about this in the video, are turned from light cruiser to a heavy cruiser whilst they're under construction by redesignating them from CL to CA. Wow. The pen truly is mightier than the sword. It can turn a light cruiser into a heavy cruiser by just the changing of a letter. Yeah, no, it doesn't work like that. Life doesn't. What could they have done in 1939? Well, again, the Japanese have left the program. They left it two years ago in 1937. What could you do in 1939? Start ordering cruisers. Lots of them. I know to an extent the US Navy will do, but more. More. The US government the US needs to open, would need to open the funds, but they need ships. They need anti-aircraft cruisers and they need heavy cruisers. They also need a swarm of destroyers, but they're going to work on those anyway. I have no doubt about that. Come on, this is the Navy which in World War I produced so many four stackers that they honestly considered using them to pay down their national debt or as a form of currency. How many four stackers is that? Oh, it's four. Oh, you're flush today, aren't you? The whole point is they can do this. They need this though. They need the cruisers, they need the seaplane tenders, they need the construction battalions to go and make use of those islands, and they need the marines to defend those islands as part of their campaign. They do know that the marine defense forces, etc., they are woefully lacking in artillery, woefully lacking in an AA, and not with, without the construction battalions, which are essential to supporting them. You have no strategic depth in defending an island. All you can do is build something. So you need to build things rapidly. You need to be able to turn up, and by the time the enemy appears and comes back after a week or two weeks, they suddenly found, oh good lord, when we left here, this place was a flat island. Now it looks like it's ready to bring Armageddon. And how many artillery guns do you have here? This is not fair. We need to bring the entire heavy fleet out. It would have been a really interesting turn of events for the Japanese to deal with, is if every island had required not just heavy cruisers, but really heavy guns to come along. You could have really overworked their fleet. If every time they tried to attack it, they had to bring a large number of their battle wagons their battleships with them. Royal Navy Commonwealth. Yes, I've divided the Royal Navy into two parts for 1939 and 1940. It, they become slightly more different in from 1941 onwards, but in this period they're still part of it. Earlier I elaborated on my idea, the plan, the concept. You have these nations building these ships. And I know, tribal class destroyers, really cool. That's the high-end vessel, the Royal Australian Navy and the Royal Canadian Navy, both picking this period. There is a vessel, though, which has been around for a little bit longer, which they could have picked. This is the Bitten class. It is the basis for the Hunt class escort destroyer. It is the basis for the Black Swan class sloop. It is the basis for the Egret class sloop. Um, it's the basis for so many different designs in the Royal Navy, it's almost absurd. There are only three ships built. They are launched in 19... They are laid down in 1944. They are launched in 1934 and commissioned in 1934, realistically. When I say laid down in 1934, they're laid down in March 1934, commissioned in December 19... Oh, launched in December 1944. That's Enchantress. Stork and Bitten, well, they're laid down in June and August 1935, and 
June 1935 and August 1936, and their commission in April 1936 and July 1937. These ships are interesting because they have geared steam turbines supporting two shafts. They develop about roughly 3,300 shaft or fat. They have a top speed of 18.75 knots, complement of 125. They displace a little over 1,000 tons. They carried six 4-inch guns in three twin mounts, four 0.5-inch AA guns in a quadruple mount, and roughly 90 depth charges. They are cheap, cheerful military capability. Again, if you had started off by sending these ships, which displace only 1,190 tons, so are firmly in the auxiliary, and despite them being... They're not designed for a speed faster than 20 knots. Sometimes they might hit a speed faster than 20 knots, but they're designed for a speed of 18 and 3 quarter knots, which is not and a quarter below 20 knots and not that much below something other, some other things. They are very, very capable. Now, in World War II, the Royal Navy ends up churning out flower class corvettes because they have to. Because in many ways you don't have the turbine production to be able to produce more sloops. But also you don't have the yard familiarity and you don't have the number of yards. So you want to use merchant shipyards. The thing is, those same yards, if given t something to build in peacetime, which is not that much bigger, let's be honest, the flower class Corvette displaces... 925 long tons, so it's 100 odd, well, nearly 200 tons, I suppose, lighter, but not that much. And it's 62 and a half meters overall length. The Bidden class sloop is 81 meters long. The beam is 11 meters for the sloop. For the Corvette, it's 10.1 meters. Draft, three and a half meters for the Corvette. Hmm, about the same on the sloop. About the same. If you had started off production in 1937, 1938, or even early 1939, of some form of flower class corvette, but also some form of bitten, or at that point, black swan class, which is a development of that, in those countries, you would immediately cause an increase in turbine production. Yes, you could have also ordered destroyers up there, and they could have built destroyers, but building these is useful. Why? Because you can justify building pretty much the same turbines you're going to use for this, pretty much the same turbines, which means those factories and those yards have to build more turbines. But you are not going to be able to be in class as endangering any treaties. Building destroyers is considered a threat to the treaty and the treaty system, which Britain in 1939 is for some reason still obsessed with trying to maintain and resurrect. But, despite it falling apart, which is part of the reasons behind the 14-inch gun decision. Oh my god. Anyway, leaving that to one side... You can build as many of those, you can build as many as a top thing as you like. Those are limited. Those you can build as many of as you want. If you'd ordered them earlier, if in 1934 you turned around and gone, yes, the Royal Navy will build 18 of these in the Britain, but we will also build for the Royal Canadian Navy another nine, for the Australian Navy another nine, for the Indians, another nine. For the South Africans, another nine. And we will build them in Canada, Australia, India, South Africa. And we'll keep doing that. The Royal Navy of World War II would have had a massive collection of very good, very capable 
anti-submarine warfare escorts without having to do a crash construction program because they'd already have more than, have more of those in service than the G Germans would have submarines. And here is the real crux of the matter. I haven't mentioned radar yet. It's another thing. If the Royal Navy had been building a pro doing a program earlier on, they might well have accelerated radar production because the re one of the reasons why they're slow, slow in implementing radar, and I mean when I say slow, I mean they're ahead of the game compared to most navies, but they're getting they aren't really mass deploying it as quickly as they could do. It's because they think they have time, because that's what they've been told. They have till 1942. That's strategic expectation. So they're acting as if they have those extra three years. If in January 1939, or goodness Lord help us, in January 1938, they turned around and gone, hang on, this isn't going to be the case, they would have started building in bigger batches. And if you're building in bigger batches of radar, if you're building in bigger batches of turbines, you build the infrastructure which supports them. And the shortages and strains the Royal Navy gets in World War II in terms of its construction, the bottlenecks, are turbine production and radar production, and turbine production and radar production. We can get on with the 4.5-inch gun. That would have been another thing which would have been amazing to have fixed, especially for all these, because they could have had a couple of... They could have had some 4.5-inch guns. They could have had six of them, and then they would have had a dual-purpose weapon, which would have been really, really good, instead of the 4-inch. But they were going at 4-inch because that was a better high-angled mount than the 4.7 inch. The 4.7 inch wasn't as good at high as good at high angle and anti aircraft engagement as the 4 inch because of the mount, not the gun. The gun was quite good at it. It's the mount. So either you need to fix the 4.7 inch mount as is fitted on this lovely uh, lovely creature. Well, actually, as originally is fitted on her. These are 4 inch mounts on her. Or you need to actually get the four and a half inch into service. And again, if you are building more of these, if you're building more small ships, you have more impetus and more money to get that four and a half inch gun working. And the four and a half inch gun and radar production, turbine production would have made a massive difference to these navies, to the Royal Navy as well, but to these navies especially. With all the things they're getting up to, those, those systems would have made a colossal difference to them early in the war. That's, even without any foreknowledge, that would have made a colossal difference to them as it was, but with some foreknowledge of what's going to happen, it would have been a massive one. Anyway, that's the major navies, allied navies, in January 1939, and roughly five. So, as I mentioned, on this one, it says 2nd of August, New Orleans class. Actually, it's going to be to Portland's, because I fancy doing them first. Thank you very much, everyone. As of this video going out, the patron vote will be live. Please, select something interesting. I know you will. You always do give me great suggestions, and the vote is always very interesting. There are going to be two patron videos this month. There can only be two, unless I rearrange whatever the brew ships are going to be. So, please, no one do the tying thing. For starters, I'm not sure I can. I actually will be able to get the free time to uh, that uh, to actually make a third PowerPoint this month because I will be that busy preparing for not just the weeks away in August, but the weeks away in September, where I'll hopefully still be doing lives and still be doing normal stuff. But it'll be just it'll be from somewhere with a more interesting internet connection. Let's say. Right. Thank you very much, Aaron. Take care and hope you enjoyed this video.